Muscles animals are able to move and have the capacity of moving blood and other material along the lumina of tubular structures because of elongated muscle cells that specialize in the ability to contract. These muscle cells are of two types, one striated, which display alternating light and dark bands. Two smooth, which lack such striations. There are two types of striated muscle, skeletal, for voluntary movements, and cardiac, for pumping blood. These specialized cells have their own nomenclature. Their cell membranes are known as sarcolemma, their smooth endoplasmic reticulum is referred to as sarcoplasmic reticulum, and their mitochondria are sometimes referred to as SDYCO sum 5. Because their length far exceeds their girth, they are frequently referred to as muscle fibers. All three are mesodermal derivatives. SKE.L.E. TA. L. M. USC.L.E. Skeletal muscle cells are formed by hundreds of MYOB lasts that line up end to end and coalesce into a myotube. Each myotube manufactures its own contractile elements, myofilaments, which are distinctively arranged to form myofibrils, and cytoskeletal components and organelles. Skeletal muscle cells, may be several centimeters long and 10 to 100 gym in diameter, and are arranged so that they not only are parallel to each other, but also the dark and light bands of adjacent cells are aligned with each other. The extracellular spaces between neighboring cells are occupied by continuous capillaries. Skeletal muscle strength is a function of the number and diameter of the muscle fibers composing a particular muscle. White fibers, example chicken breast, are designed for fast contractility but are easily fatigued. Red fibers, example dark meat, contract slower but are not fatigued easily. Fibers that are in between red and white are intermediate fibers. White fibers have a poorer vascular supply, fewer mitochondria, fewer oxidative enzymes, and less of the oxygen transporting protein myoglobin than red fibers, but their diameters are larger, and their sarcoplasmic reticulum is more extensive the nerve supply determines whether a muscle fiber is red or white, and switching the fiber of one muscle cell type to that of the other switches the characteristic of the muscle cell to the modality of its new innervation. The connective tissue elements of skeletal muscle not only harness the contraction-derived energy of the muscle, but also conduct neurovascular elements to each muscle cell and subdivide the muscle mass into smaller units, known as fascicles. Each fascicle, enveloped by its paramecium, is composed of numerous skeletal muscle fibers, each with its own, slender connective tissue investment the endomysium, whose reticular fibers interweave with those of adjacent cells. The connective tissue surrounding the entire muscle, the epimysium, is continuous with the tendons and aponeuroses of the whole muscle and is intimately related to the reticular fibers of the endomysium that interdigitate with the fluted ends of the muscle cell, this relationship is the myotendinous junction. Light microscopy of skeletal muscle, along the length of the skeletal muscle fiber, small regenerative cells, known as satellite cells and POSSing a single nucleus, are present, sharing the external lamina of the muscle fiber. Occasional fibroblasts are also noted in the endomysium. The cytoplasm of skeletal muscle cells is packed with cylindrical myofibrils. Myofibrils are precisely arranged so that their dark and light bands are aligned with those of their neighbors, these bands are aligned along the length of the muscle fiber. I bands are transect by Z disc, line, dark bands, A bands, are bisected by a light area, the H band, which is transect by a thin M line. The contractile unit of skeletal muscle, the sarcomere, extends from Z disc to Z disc. During muscle contraction, the sarcomere shortens, the Z discs are closer to each other, the H band disappears, and the I bands become narrower, but the A band does not change. Temporary myositis is a mild to severe inflammation of skeletal muscles that results from accidental injury, infection, strenuous exercise, viral infection, or certain prescription drugs. 
Symptoms include muscle pain, muscle weakness, tenderness of the area over the region of the muscle, warmth, and reduced or impaired function. As its name suggests, the condition is not serious, it is temporary, and the problem resolves itself when the offending condition is removed. Myositis can be a very serious condition that includes numerous inflammatory myopathies, dermatomyositis, inclusion body myositis, the juvenile form of myositis, and polymyositis. All of these diseases are idiopathic, although they may be autoimmune diseases. The general symptoms for all of these myopathies are painful, weak muscles, general malaise, reduced mobility especially in climbing stairs and standing up after falling down, and frequently difficulties in deglutition, dysphagia. Electron microscopy of skeletal Electron microscopy of skeletal muscle 96 The sarcolemma is similar in most respects to other cell membranes except that in skeletal muscle it forms numerous deep, tubular invaginations. T-tubules, Fig 8.2, extend into the cytoplasm and interweave, always at the junction of the ienda bands, throughout the interior of the muscle fiber. Two T-tubules for each sarcomere spread waves of depolarization into the interior of the muscle fiber. Two terminal cisterni, expanded regions of the sarcoplasmic reticulum that store calcium, flank each T-tubule at the IA junctions, known as a triad, around every myofibril. Voltage-gated calcium release channels, rheonodine receptors, of the terminal cisterni are in close association with the voltage-sensitive dihydropyridine-sensitive receptors DHSR, of the T-tubules, this complex is known as junctional feed. As the wave of depolarization is conducted into the interior of the muscle cell, the DHSR causes calcium release channels to open, and calcium leaves the terminal cisterni to enter the sarcoplasm, Fig 8.3, see Fig 8.2. Chapter The A and I bands of adjacent myofilaments are closely aligned with each other. This relationship is maintained by Desmin, which wraps around the Z-discs of adjacent myofibrils, fastening them to each other and to Z-discs via the assistance of plectin. The heat shock protein tip crystalline protects Desmin from stresses placed on it. Coactin binding protein dystrophin fixes Desmin to the costumier regions of the sarcolemma. Long Tubular mitochondria occupy spaces among myofilament bundles and the periphery of the sarcoplasm deep to the cell membrane. The sarcoplasm is rich in myoglobin. Structural organization of myofibrils, the dark and light bands seen in light microscopy are due to the presence of parallel, interdigitating, thin myofilaments, one gym in length, seven rim in diameter, and composed mainly of actin, and thick myofilaments, 1.5 im long. 15 nanometers in diameter, and composed principally of m osin 2 Thin filaments extend from each side of the Z-disc in opposite directions toward the middle of successive sarcomeres. The two Z-discs of a single sarcomere have thin filaments pointing toward the center of that sarcomere and pointing toward the center of the sarcomeres to its right and left sides. If the skeletal muscle cell is not contracted, neither the thin nor the thick filaments extend the entire length of the sarcomere, and the area on either side of a particular Z-disc, composed only of thin filaments, is the I-band of light microscopy. An I-band is composed of two halves, each belonging to adjacent sarcomeres. The area of a particular relaxed sarcomere that is composed of the entire length of the thick filament is the A-band. The center of the A-band of a relaxed sarcomere is void of thin filaments, and this represents the H-band, an area rich in creatine kinase, the enzyme that catalyzes the transfer of high-energy phosphate from creatine phosphate to form adenosine triphosphate, ATP. In the center of the H-band is the M-line, composed mainly of C-protein and myomesin, macromolecules that interconnect the thick filaments to each other and assist in maintaining their proper position to permit the interdigitation of the thick filaments with the thin filaments. When a muscle cell contracts, the thin filaments slide past the thick filaments and drag the Z-discs closer to each other, shortening the sarcomere by approximately 0.4 gym. Because a single skeletal muse Cle cell may have 100,000 sarcomeres in sequence, a change in length of 0.4 gym per sarcomere means that the contracted muscle becomes 4 centimeters shorter. 
For the thin filaments to be able to interact with the thick filaments as they slide past them, the morphologic arrangements must be very precise. In mammalian skeletal muscle, each thick filament is surrounded by six thin filaments at 60 degree intervals so that in cross section the thin filaments form a hexagon with a thick filament in the center, Fig 8.4. Five proteins are responsible for maintaining the correct relationships among the sarcomere components, two titan molecules, large, elastic proteins extend from each Z-disc of the same sarcomere to the M-line, ensure that the thick filaments remain in the correct position. T-iactinans anchor thin filaments to the Z-disc Two nebulin molecules extend from the Z-disc to the end of each thin filament, ensuring that the thin filaments are in their proper positions, and that they are exactly the correct length. The length of the thin filament is also controlled by Cap-Z and tropomodulin, molecules that prevent the addition to or deletion of G-actin to or from the thin filament. Cap-Z acts at the barbed plus end, at the Z-disc, whereas tropomodulin acts at the pointed minus end of the thin filament. Thick filaments dot approximately 300 myosin 2 molecules each 2 to 3 nanometers in diameter and 150 nanometers long, are present in a thick filament. Myosin 2 molecules are composed of, two heavy chains two pairs of light chains, each pair consists of an essential light chain and a regulatory light chain, Fig 8.5, and the regulatory light chain can be phosphorylated by myosin light chain kinase, MLCK, each of the two identical heavy chains resembles a golf club, and the polypeptide chains, handles, of the two form an O-helix as they wrap around each other. Each heavy chain can be enzymatically cleaved by trypsin into, rod-like light meromyosin heavy meromyosin, two globular heads with a short stalk, composed of two polypeptide chains wrapped around each other, Papain cleaves heavy meromyosin into two globular regions, S, and the short stalk, SZ, chapter each S, subfragment has three binding sites ADP, light chain myosin, and factin binding sites. Myosin molecules are arranged head to tail in a thick filament so that the center of the thick filament is smooth, and the two ends appear barbed because of the projection of the S, subfragments. Myosin molecules possess two pliant regions one at the junction of the S and somoides, and one at the junction of the heavy and light meromyosins that allow myosin 2 to contact and drag the thin filament toward the center of the sarcomere. Co-thin filaments, thin filaments, composed of F-actin, tropomyosin, and troponin, have a barbed plus end attached to the Z-disc and a pointed minus end capped by tropomodulin, Fig 8.6. F-actin consists of two chains of G-actin polymers, which resemble two strands of pearls twisted around each other. The two shallow grooves formed in this fashion are each occupied by 40 nm long linear tropomyosin molecules arranged head to toe. The tropomyosin molecules mask the active site of each G-actin molecule so that it is unavailable for contact by the S, subunit of the myosin 2 molecule. A tripartite troponin molecule is bound to each tropomyosin. The three components are troponin C, TNC, which binds free calcium, troponin T, TNT, which binds the troponin molecule to tropomyosin, and troponin I, TNI, which inhibits the interaction of the S subunit with C actin. If free calcium ions are available, they bind to TNC causing a conformational change in the troponin molecule that pushes the tropomyosin molecule deeper into the groove of the factin filament and, by unmasking the active site, allows temporary binding with the S, subunit. Muscle contraction, muscle contraction usually occurs after a nervous impulse, and for each individual muscle cell, it follows the all or none law, which is that either the cell contracts or it does not. The amount of shortening is a function of the number of sarcomeres in a particular myofibril, and the strength of contraction of an entire muscle depends on the number of muscle cells that are contracting. Myofilaments do not contract, instead, according to the Huxley sliding filament theory, the thin filaments slide past the thick filaments as follows, T-tubules convey the impulse generated at the myoneural junction to the terminal cisternae. Voltage-gated calcium release channels of the terminal cisternae open, and CA ions, released into the sarcoplasm, bind to TNC, altering its conformation and pushing the tropomyosin deeper into the groove, 
unmasking the myosin binding site of C-actin molecules. Hydrolysis of ADP on the S, moiety of myosin 2 results in the formation of adenosine diphosphate, ADP, and inorganic phosphate, PI, both of which remain attached to the S, moiety. The myosin head swivels, and the entire complex becomes bound to the myosin binding site of G-actin, Cfig 8.6. P, leaves the complex, this not only results in a stronger bond between the myosin and the actin, but also the S, moiety alters its conformation and releases ADP, and the conformation of the myosin head alters and pulls the thin filament toward the center of the sarcomere. This movement is referred to as the power stroke of muscle contraction. The S, moiety accepts a new ADP, releasing the bond between actin and myosin, Cfig 8.6. For muscle contraction to be complete, the attachment and release cycles must be repeated approximately 200 to 300 times, and each cycle necessitates the hydrolysis of an ADP. Mutations in some of the structural proteins that are responsible for the integrity of the myofibrillar organization of skeletal muscle can be devastating. If the primary structure of the intermediate filament desmin or of the heat shock protein OB Christian is altered, the myofibrils cannot be fixed in their proper position in three-dimensional space, and the myofibrils become destroyed under conditions of stressful contractile forces. Rigor mortis is a condition that occurs after death. During muscle contraction in a living individual, ADP on the S1 moiety, myosin head, of myosin 2 is hydrolyzed into ADP and P but neither ADP nor I leaves the myosin head. A change in conformation of myosin 2 allows the head to contact the myosin binding site of G-actin of the thin filament. This contact is followed by the release of P, and a stronger bond between myosin and actin, a ND then ADP is released from the myosin head resulting in the power stroke. New ADP binds to the myosin head releasing the bond between the S1 moiety of myosin 2 and the G-actin of the thin filament. In a dead individual, ADP is not regenerated, and after a while the muscle's ADP supply becomes exhausted, the sarcoplasmic reticulum can no longer sequester calcium, and muscle contraction continues until ADP is no longer available to detach the S1 moiety of myosin 2 from the thin filament, and a sustained muscle contraction, i.e., muscle rigidity, ensues. This rigidity is known as rigor mortis. Depending on the ambient temperature, a little while later, lysosomal enzymes escape from the lysosomes and break down the actin and myosin, resolving rigor mortis. During late spring in temperate zones, rigor mortis begins 3 to 8 hours after death, and the stiffness lasts 16 to 24 hours, by 36 hours after death, the muscles are no longer rigid. Muscle relaxation, the process of muscle contraction requires the presence of free calcium ions in the sarcoplasm. When the neural stimulus ceases, and the T-tubules no longer convey the wave of depolarization into the interior of the muscle cell, the voltage-gated calcium release channels of the terminal cisternae close. The sarcoplasmic calcium is driven back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum by the action of calcium pumps to be sequestered by calsequestrin. Because calcium is no longer abundant, TNC releases its calcium ions and regains its relaxed conformation, the tropomyosin molecule occupies its previous position, hiding the active site of the C-actin molecule, and myosin and actin are unable to bind to each other. Innervation of skeletal muscle, skeletal muscle cells receive motor nerve fibers, which induce muscle contraction, sensory nerve fibers, which supply muscle spindles and Kalgai tendon organs that protect the muscle from injury, and autonomic fibers, which control the vascular supply of the muscle. Depending on the degree of fine coordination of a particular muscle, it may have a rich nerve supply, as in the muscles of the eyes, in which a single motoneuron may control only five muscle cells, or crude nerve supply, as in the muscles of the back, in which a single motoneuron may control several hundred muscle cells. The motoneuron and all of the muscle cells that it controls are known as a motor unit. All the muscle fibers of a particular motor unit either contract simultaneously or do not contract at all. Impulse transmission at the neuromuscular junction, 
skeletal muscle cells are innervated by the myelinated axons of TI motoneurons. These axons use the connective tissue elements of the muscle as they herbarize to reach each skeletal muscle cell of their motor unit. As an axon branch reaches its muscle cell, it loses its myelin sheath, but retains its Schwann cell cover, and forms an expanded axon terminal, presynaptic membrane, over the motor end plate, postsynaptic membrane, a modified region of the sarcolemma. The combination of the motor end plate, primary, synaptic cleft, the space between the presynaptic and postsynaptic membranes, and axon terminal is known as a neuromuscular junction, Fig 8.7. The postsynaptic membrane has numerous folds, and the spaces between these folds are referred to as secondary synaptic clefts, junctional folds. The folds and secondary synaptic clefts are lined by an external lamina. The axon terminal is covered by Schwann cells, and it houses mitochondria, sarcoplasmic reticulum, and several hundred thousand synaptic vesicles that contain the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, proteoglycans, ADP and various other substances. The presynaptic membrane displays dense bars in the vicinity of which the membrane houses voltage-gated calcium channels. The transmission of a stimulus occurs in the following manner, a stimulus, traveling along the axon, reaches and depolarizes the presynaptic membrane, causing an opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels and the influx of calcium into the axon terminal. With each impulse, Approximately 120 synaptic vesicles fuse with the active sites of the presynaptic membrane along the dense bars, releasing a quantum of acetylcholine, approximately 20,000 molecules, proteoglycans, and ATP into the primary synaptic cleft, Fig 8.8. Acetylcholine receptors of the postsynaptic, muscle, membrane bind the released acetylcholine, opening ligand-gated sodium channels of the postsynaptic membrane, and the influx of sodium causes depolarization of the sarcolemma and T-tubule. The wave of depolarization reaches the terminal cisterni, and calcium is released at the IA junction to initiate muscle contraction. In less than 500 millisecond, the enzyme acetylcholinesterase, located in the external lamina of the primary and secondary synaptic clefts, degrades acetylcholine into choline and acetate, the resting membrane potential of the postsynaptic membrane is re-established, preventing a single release of acetylcholine from precipitating multiple contractions. The sodium concentration gradient powers a sodium choline support to ferry the choline back into the axon terminal where activated acetate, derived from mitochondria, combines with the choline facilitated by the action of the enzyme choline O-acetyltransferase. The acetylcholine is conveyed into synaptic vesicles by a proton gradient powered by antiport carrier proteins. The surface area of the presynaptic membrane remains constant because of the membrane trafficking mechanism. Clostridium tetany is a common, spore-forming bacterium that lives in the soil and, under anaerobic conditions, forms a toxin that blocks glycine, an inhibitory neurotransmitter produced by certain neurons of the central nervous system. Usually, the infection occurs when the bacterium is introduced by soil or contaminant into a penetrating wound. The proliferating bacteria release the toxin, which enters the spinal cord and inhibits the release of glycine, resulting in spasmodic muscle contraction, known as tetanus. The initial symptoms, stiffness of the muscles of mastication, may be noted 2 to 50 days after the infection. The initial stiffness may develop into a lack of ability to open the mouth, commonly referred to as lockjaw. Additional symptoms include stiffness of other muscles, in severe conditions, the muscles of the neck, abdomen, and back can go into violent spasms causing the forward arching of the thorax and abdomen and the posterior ward stretching of the head and lower extremities, a typical position in late tetanus referred to as epistatanos. The global death toll is approximately 50,000 people per year. The best prevention is the administration of tetanus vaccination followed by a booster shot every 10 years. Treatment involves an antibiotic regimen with accompanying tetanus immunoglobulin to inactivate the toxin. Analgesics, sedation, muscle relaxants, and ventilation may be required to assist the patient in breathing. Sensory system of skeletal muscle, 
the activity of a muscle has to be monitored to ensure that the muscle or its tendons are not injured. Muscle spindle monitor the alteration and at S rate in the length of a muscle. The Kalgai tendon organ monitors the tensile forces and the rate at which the tensile forces develop in a tendon as the muscle shortens. Information gathered by these two sensory organs reaches the spinal cord for processing. The information is also transmitted to the cerebellum for subconscious processing and to the cerebral cortex where the information may reach conscious levels so that the individual can become aware of the position of his or her muscles. Muscle spindles Muscle spindles, Fig 8.9, are encapsulated sensory receptors interspersed among skeletal muscle fibers that cause stretched muscles to contract chapter automatically, a proprioceptive response known as the stretch reflex. These encapsulated muscle spindles are composed of a few modified skeletal muscle cells, known as intrafusal fibers, located within the fluid containing periaxial space, they are arranged parallel to the longitudinal axis of the muscle. Although the skeletal muscle cells that surround the muscle spindle are ordinary muscle cells, they are referred to as extrafusal muscle fibers. There are two types of intrafusal fibers, nuclear bag fibers and nuclear chain fibers. The nuclear bag fibers are wider and fewer in number than the nuclear chain fibers. Both fiber types have their nuclei located in the center of the cell, and their contractile regions are limited to their polar regions. Co-nuclei of the nuclear bag fibers form a clump in the expanded region in the middle of the cell. Nuclei of the nuclear chain fibers, aligned in a row, do not form a clump in the middle of these cells. Nuclear bag fibers are of two types, dynamic and static. Although the nerve supply of the intrafusal fibers seems to be complex, it is really very straightforward because they receive two types of sensory fibers, which innervate the nuclear regions, and two types of motor fibers, which innervate the contractile regions. The nuclear regions of nuclear chain and both types of nuclear bag fibers of a muscle spindle are innervated by branches of a single, large, myelinated group IA, also referred to as IA or dynamic sensory ending, nerve fiber that wraps around this region in a spiral fashion. The nuclear areas of all nuclear chain fibers and only static nuclear bag fibers of a muscle spindle are innervated by branches of a single, sensory group 2 nerve fiber, also referred to as static or 2 sensory nerve endings, that wrap around this area of the cells, see Fig 8.9. Motor innervation to the polar, contractile, regions of all nuclear chain fibers and only static nuclear bag fibers is by axons of static y motoneurons, whereas the polar regions of dynamic nuclear bag fibers receive their motor innervation from axons of dynamic y motoneurons all extrafusal fibers are innervated by myelinated axons of y motoneurons stretching of a skeletal muscle stretches the muscle spindle and stimulates group IA, dynamic, and group 2, static, sensory nerve. Fibers these fibers fire more often with increased stretching of the muscle. Also, group IA fibers respond to a change in the rate at which the muscle fiber is stretched. A muscle spindle provides information not only about how rapidly a muscle is stretched, but also about unexpected stretching of the muscle. The Y motoneurons induce contraction of the two polar regions of the intrafusal fibers, stretching and sensitizing them to even minute changes in the stretching of a muscle. Golgi tendon organs, in contrast to muscle spindles, Kalgai tendon organs monitor the tensile forces, and the rate at which these forces develop, placed on tendons due to the shortening, contraction, of a skeletal muscle. Kalgai tendon organs, situated at the muscle tendon interface, are about 1 mm long and 0.1 mm in diameter and are parallel to the longitudinal axis of the muscle. They are composed of wavy collagen fibers whose interstices house non-myelinated branches of type LB axons. As the muscle contracts and places tensile forces on the tendon, the wavy collagen fibers straighten out and compress the free nerve endings. The rate of impulse generation in these nerve fibers is a function of the tensile forces that the tendon is experiencing. If the force approaches critical values so that the tendon, muscle, and bone can be damaged, the Kalgai tendon organ acts to inhibit further contraction of the muscle. 
Muscle spindles monitor the stretching and Kalgai tendon organs monitor the contraction of the same muscle to coordinate spinal control over skeletal muscle reflexes. Myasthenia gravis, Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease that has highest prevalence among women 20 to 40 years old, but can affect individuals of both genders and all ages. Approximately 10% of these patients have tumors of the thymus, the antibodies can cross the placental barrier, and in 10% to 12% of pregnant women, infants are born with a temporary myasthenia gravis that spontaneously resolves before two months of age. Patients with myasthenia gravis form antibodies against their acetylcholine receptors, reducing the ability of the muscle to contract properly. Although the blocked receptors are internalized and replaced by the muscle cell, the disease overpowers the ability of the system to repair itself. The disease affects especially the muscles of the face, particularly the extrinsic muscles of the eyes. Additionally, muscles of the throat and the rest of the body become affected resulting in difficulties in speech and swallowing and generalized muscle weakness involving most of the muscles of the body. The degree of weakness fluctuates from mild to severe. The severe condition is known as myasthenia crisis, and it may involve the muscles of respiration with fatal consequences. Immunosuppressants and drugs that increase the production of acetylcholine can frequently control the condition. Simple reflex arc, muscle spindles, such as the patellar reflex, are designed as two neuron reflexes, which react to stretching of their parent muscle by initiating the contraction of that muscle. An example of the importance of such a reflex is shown by the following scenario, as a person is standing at ease, someone approaches the person from the back and kicks him or her in the right popliteal fossa, behind the right knee. That action causes the right leg to bend, the right knee moves forward, and the right leg begins to buckle. As the knee moves forward, the large quadriceps muscle, four muscles in the front of the thigh, of the right leg is stretched, the sensory nerve fibers of the muscle spindles fire, and the wave of depolarization enters the spinal cord. Neurotransmitters are released at the synapse to stimulate the amotoneurons of the ventral horn of the spinal cord that serve the extrafusal muscle fibers of the right quadriceps muscle and cause them to contract. As the quadriceps muscle of the right leg contracts, the right leg straightens and prevents the person from falling down. This system was designed to be activated when an individual trips and the reflex arc protects the individual from falling down.